Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for our, our second um, Insight into talk of this academic year following uh, last month's talk on engineering. Um, I know I'm really looking forward to this evening's talk um, on careers in heritage and the arts, especially as one of the questions I'm most often um, asked as head of careers is along the lines of I'm studying arts subjects or humanities subjects, what careers can I do with these? So um, I'm really looking forward to, to this one. For anyone who's not attended one of these talks before, um, the structure is that we hear from our, our alumni, uh, our, our three speakers um, first. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about routes into, uh, into, into these careers. And there's usually time at the end for some uh, questions and answers. You can um, type these. If you open up the question and answer section on Teams, you can type in your questions and then at the end, I'll, I'll direct them to uh, someone who hopefully can give you an answer. Um, we usually finish around uh, 7 to 7.30. We were planning to have four speakers tonight, but unfortunately, um, Julia Dennis um, is unable to join us. But uh, we're very fortunate to have um, Connie and Blesney and Marie all here. And they're going to talk to us about their, their career paths in uh, heritage and the arts. Um, I'm feeling exceptionally old because this is the, the first time I've ever taught all three of uh, the speakers at an insight into um, uh, speak, uh, into or talk, but I'm going to try not to think about that too much. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Connie, who I'll try and get this right, I think left in 2019. Um, and recently graduated, I think, and now working as an as an artist. Um, so um, over to you, Connie. Thank you, Mr. Tannen. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. I'm Connie. Uh, so yeah, as Mr. Tannen said, I was at Man High from 2012, uh, where I started in year seven till 2019 and it really does not feel like that long ago and I really miss it um but anyway so today I'm going to be taking you guys through my time in high school and sixth form uh university and what I've been doing since graduating so when I first started at Man High um I'd always really loved drawing and being creative um and I kind I actually remember it was in year eight um and Miss Chambers basically liked this painting I did and just told me to do whatever I wanted in the lesson uh, and you know have my own artistic st style and that really kind of inspired me to pursue art. Uh, so when I was choosing my GCSEs I really wasn't like sciencey or mathematical at all. If you are that's really impressive but for me I was always into art, history, um, so my extra choices, choices were art, history uh, and geography. And then when it came to my AS, my AS levels, I knew I enjoyed, you know, analysing texts, being creative. And I actually quite liked like essay writing, which sounds weird, but it was just something I enjoyed. Um, so for my ASs, I chose classical, classical civilization, history, English literature and art. And then for my A-levels, um, I actually stopped classics just because I wanted to focus more on like three subjects, just because, you know, yeah. Um, but I remember to an extent really enjoying my A-levels as I was just studying these subjects that I had a really, you know, genuine interest in. Um, and although they are kind of different in their own ways, I feel like the three of them together worked really well and enabled me to be both analytically creative, you know, in English literature and history through the essay writing and the analysis, but also in art, I still got to, you know, be visually uh, analytical and creative and also, you know, conceptually creative in how I like led my own coursework. And my advice like for A-levels is to, you know, enjoy them as much as you can. I know they're hard work and it's so stressful because you have to get the right grades to go to the right uni. But, you know, you'll never really get to study three subjects or four in like so much depth again like obviously you go to university and do your course but you know I'll never get to you know study like Shakespeare again and tragedy like 
well I could if I wanted to but you know just doing it within the A-level context like I kind of missed that um, and I'd say some advice for taking art at A-level since it's a lot more coursework based you know don't leave everything to the end you know everyone says that but it's actually true and that's why everyone says it as you'll want to be revising for your other subjects you know later on in the year so I'd say for art, you know, work consistently throughout the year. I remember staying like after school to paint. So I'd save myself the stress I'd have at the end. Um, and also, I'm sure I've, all the teachers say it, but like always check the mark scheme. But then also don't be afraid, you know, to create whatever you want, because if you create work that's more authentic to you, you know, it's always going to be of a better quality. As well as this, um, I feel that the extracurriculars I took part in also really inspired me creatively. So from year nine, I took part in after school life drawing classes where I learnt about the form, you know, the human form and how to accurately draw. And then in junior six, um, I took part in this competition called Articulation and I was a regional finalist in it. And I really encourage anyone who is interested in art or the history of art to take part in this competition. Um, you know, history of art isn't like a subject that you can actually do at A level um, at the moment, but um, articulation really gives you a slight flavour of what the course is like. So the competition basically entails visual analysis of an artist or art movement with in-depth research as well as your own interpretations. And I think taking part in that competition, uh, it really assisted in helping me decide what I wanted to do at uni. As initially, I was quite torn um, between doing something that was, you know, purely creative, like an art foundation, or doing, you know, a degree like English literature. But as both an artist and just someone who really appreciates art and, you know, going to museums and looking at it, I knew that I couldn't completely stop learning about it. And from articulation, I had learned that I enjoyed analysing and actually discussing art itself. Also, as I enjoyed the analytical sides of history and English literature so much, I wanted to look into degrees that could, you know, encompass that side of art and, you know, talking about it with like essay writing and stuff like that. So I remember it was Mr. Vance who suggested that I look into the history of art, um, which was essentially a combination of all these things that I really liked. Um, and also since I knew that I could always paint independently, I felt like I didn't really need to like be taught how to paint. So I opted to study the history of art at uni, which would actually let me write about art itself. So now it was time for me to select my uni choices. So I knew that I wanted to go to an even bigger city than Manchester. So both of my choices were in London. So one of my choices uh, was this place, it's called the Courtauld Institute of Art. And that basically only teaches uh, the history of art. And it's, you know, it's a really renowned university. But the problem with it for me was that it was too small. So I chose to go to UCL because it's a far bigger university. And I knew that a really key priority of mine, especially when moving to a city like London, was to be able to meet as many different people as possible. Um, so yeah, I moved to London. I was very, very scared. Um, I can say now I'm less scared, kind of. Um, but if I give you guys a rundown of what my week was like when I was there, when it wasn't during COVID time. Um, so the thing about doing history of art is that it actually has some of the least contact hours. So for me, I was only required to be in university, you know, doing lectures and seminars for about 10 hours a week. Um, and at UCL on my course, they made me take a subsidiary course for the first two years and a language. So I took Italian um, and then as my subsidiary course, I did social anthropology, but you could also choose from other subjects like philosophy or archeology. span um, But basically social anthropology is kind of like the study of humans and human interaction in different cultures. And then on the actual history of art course, uh, you could have complete freedom in like your choice of modules. So I remember I did like such a range of modules um, for my whole three years. So I like did one on colonial Latin American art and then I did one on Gothic architecture 
And then I did one about how robotics have been integrated into contemporary art. So I was learning about a lot of different things. Um, but I think, you know, this wide range of courses really allowed me to have a very diverse understanding of what the history of art can mean. Um, as I think many, you know, if you don't know about it, you kind of assume it's going to be this very linear taught thing. But yeah, I think UCL is quite disruptive in the way that they, you know, make you rethink ideas of history. Um, so then my actual day at uni would usually entail like a lecture, which would be about two hours. Uh, and then I'd probably go, you know, to the library and start researching for like a big essay or a project. And then, you know, I'd say about four times a week, I'd have a seminar and the seminar would normally be, it's, it would normally be like an hour and a half. And it's kind of like a school lesson in a way, like it's more interactive. It's in a smaller group. And there, you know, at UCL especially, they'd always, they always want you to have an opinion and have a completely different outlook on what you've been taught, which sometimes is fun and other times you just, yeah. Um, but over my three years studying at UCL, there was a lot of talk within my course about what careers people take on after completing their bachelors. And the most talked about was working, you know, within an auction house of some kind, so like Sotheby's or Christie's, those are like the top ones that everyone wants to get into, or, you know, working in a gallery or a museum of some kind. So in my second year, by this point, I'd kind of stopped painting um, whilst I was attending university, just because I was so focused on this idea of like working for an institution as like an art historian. So in the summer of my second year, uh, I got a paid like summer internship at a contemporary art gallery and there I worked as an art consultant. So basically my day would consist of me opening up the gallery, you know, talking to people who would walk in, making like calls to people uh, and discussing the art that was on sale. Uh, yeah, and this internship, I would say, was really significant in helping me decide what I wanted to do. Um, as in trying out, you know, this different type of job role, which I thought was going to be completely right for me as an art history student, I actually learned that even though, you know, I really did love like discussing the artworks, meeting new people, um, and it taught me a lot of things that you don't learn at school, like sales, how to work in more convert commercial client-based environments. The gallery setting itself was just not proactive enough for me it just it didn't inspire me I just yeah I just didn't want to carry on so during that summer I'd also started painting again which is something you know I did so much when I was back in sixth form and I kind of went back into it and I was also doing uh, on top of all of this some part-time assistant work for this top contemporary artist uh, who I knew and I think that when I saw his success as an artist you know, and how he could like choose how he structured his days and work for himself. It really inspired me. And it got me thinking about like how after university, I would be happiest working for myself full time. Um, yeah, so with all these different things I put together, you know, from my commercial experience of working in the gallery and with the encouragement and like mentoring by this artist that I've been working for, I decided that at the end of my third year, I was going to like go out on my own and like start selling my own artwork. And I think it's also because so I'm so I was 21 when well, I'm 21, and I just thought like now is the time to take the leap and like actually go for what I really want because I thought I could be safe and carry on with this job in the art gallery, but I knew that I'd like really regret never attempting a career and actually being an artist. And so many people are like, oh, you're being an artist. But I just thought I have to do this for myself because if not, I'm just, you know, I won't forgive myself. So during my third year, I started selling my work and I did that actually a lot through Instagram and word of mouth, just because I'd obviously met a lot of people in the gallery. And it is, it's just through going to different events, you know, you talk to people and when people meet you, you know, they want to see your work. Um, and also my art mentor, he offered for me to actually paint and create my own work in his studio. And then he actually sold some of my work for me. So through all of this, I was kind of able to, you know, start selling. Um, and then once I graduated, which was three months ago, I've now, cause like now, like I don't have uni, so I'm like on my own. Um, I've been slowly building up my Instagram 
So I've definitely learned that it's a slow, gradual process because I can be quite impatient. You know, I feel like I want instant success, but you have to just remember, you have to be patient, build yourself up. Um, but yeah, Instagram, it's a great way to connect with other artists and be seen by potential art collectors. So I'm now currently working on trying to build up a brand and a kind of identity for myself, you know, looking into what my art is about and how I can market it. Um, I just know that, you know, I want my art to be accessible. So now my average day, what does that look like? It's been interesting trying to work out how do you plan your day when it's just like when you're your own boss, because obviously you could just easily want to stay in bed but now I make sure I'm always at my studio for about 9 a.m um so I found like a, a really cheap studio to rent in London in like a storage unit but it, it, yeah um so then I'll get there I'll work on some paintings um I managed to get myself into like this group exhibition in London in December so I've got that to work towards and then I normally paint till about 2 p.m have a break and then some days I either go back to the studio and keep painting till like six or I'll do some work on my laptop. So now I'm working on like, you know, emailing galleries, potential like applying to art fairs, potential prospects. And then I also always make sure that I stay in good contact with people who have already bought my work. Um, because normally if someone buys one piece, they're always interested in like what you're doing and buying more. And then I've had like a few studio visits. So people actually come and see my work and they meet me, which is always fun. Um, and a lot of the time I say I do have to be on my phone. Um, like I always make sure I reply to Instagram DMs. I make sure I post every single day, which can actually be quite hard. Um, but I've sold quite a few works through Instagram, which is really good. Um, but I do feel like at this stage, I'm still learning how to navigate being self-employed. Um, another good thing is I set myself a target uh, every month, like how much money I need to make. Because obviously, you know, I've got friends who are in office jobs who have a set salary. So I'm trying to do that for myself. Um, my current target is to sell two pieces of art a month, which is actually a lot harder than it sounds. Um, but yeah. So many of you may think, what was the point of going to university and studying the history of art? Um, you know, if you've just become an artist. But I'm so grateful that I did that. I think if I hadn't have moved away and gone to university, I, ne I would never have had the confidence to do what I'm doing now. You know, I'd be a completely different person who wouldn't have thought that this could even be possible. So my main message, although it may be obvious, is to really go for whatever you want and just have endless belief in yourself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Connie. Um, there was there was so much in there that I think is really is really valuable for our, for our audience. Um, so much, you know, it was really good to hear you talk about you know about your A levels and and what you what you took from your different subjects. And also, um, I'll, I'll pass on some of that to Mrs. Chambers and Mr. Vance about you know em embracing the extracurricular activities and um, studying things in depth. But I also thought it was really interesting what you said about, you, you know, you have to make a kind of decision about going for an art foundation or for history of art. And, and you, you wanted to keep up the, the kind of analytical side of writing about art and discussing it, but how you've now kind of come back to the, the creative side. So that was uh, that was really interesting. Also, what you said about studying in London, which is, you know, going to uni in London and everything that that entails as well, which um, I know will be really, really interesting for lots of people listening. Um, I think, I mean, I'll come back to, there was so much in there, it's hard to, I, I don't want to kind of um, repeat everything you've said, but it was interesting what you said about the value of the internship and also, you know, your, your how you started to grow your commercial awareness and then the way you use social media and so on. So there was there was lots and lots in there. Um, thank you for kind of bringing all that, all that together. Um, I'm sure if you want to start putting on any questions, maybe if you've got any questions um, for for Connie, you're very welcome to put them in the in the question and answer section. Um, but we are going to um, keep going and hear from our, our second speaker, who um, is Glesney, who, who uh, left in 2011 and is now a freelance art journalist and translator. And she's actually joining us 
from um, Bologna at the moment uh, in Italy and she's going to talk about her her career in art but also about studying studying languages I think and and about studying in, and, and working in Europe as well so um, Besni over to you hello hi so I'm Besni um, I was at Mannheim from 2004 to 2011 um, I really enjoyed my time at Manhai and um, just as Connie said, I didn't go for the classical kind of scientific route where I had my friends who knew that they wanted to be lawyers or they wanted to be dentists or doctors. I decided to study the things that I was really interested in and so um, my A-levels were in fine art, uh, Latin and German. And I also did AS in chemistry, so a real mix. <laughs> um, I also have to add that um, for my GCSEs, I actually got a B for art. And I remember, I can't remember who, um, I really had to fight to do art at A level because they said, oh, um, you've got much higher grades in other subjects, you should follow other subjects, you're much stronger in, I think it was maths even. Um, but I said, no, no, I really want to study art at A-level. I know it's what I want to do, that's what I'm interested in. And in the end, I actually got full marks at A-level. So it really proves if you're really interested and passionate about something, you can follow it. And as Connie said, you have to put the work in. You have to prove to yourself, or in this case also to your teachers and to even the exam board, that you are capable and also that if you want something, you can follow it. Um, so yeah, so I really enjoyed my A-levels and I was un undecided on whether to follow the languages route, seeing as I'd done German and Latin, or follow the art route, um, going to an art foundation or doing history of art. And in the end, I decided to follow languages. Um, I did German and ab initio Italian at the University of Sussex, which is in Brighton. Um, so ab initio means starting from scratch. Um, so the first lesson was literally ciao like basics and time that I was at Sussex um, Italian was actually um, the, the best department in the whole country for Italian um, I had an amazing teacher so I have to thank her actually for the enthusiasm and passion for the language that transmitted to the, to the students of the class and um, so Sussex uh, four-year degree, classic languages degree, um, but split into two. And so within the degree, you also look at cultural aspects, you look at literature, you look at film, uh, history. Uh, it's not just the language. Um, the final year is concentrated more on translation and more difficult tax. Um, but the third year is a year abroad. And um, seeing as Italian was my weaker language at the time, um, I had to go to Italy. I had to spend some time in Italy um, and I decided on Bologna, uh, which is where I am today. I decided on Bologna because it's the oldest university in the Western world, uh, 1088. And um, I also decided against Venice because uh, I knew it was a very touristy location, same with Rome. And so I was a bit, I was, I was a bit cautious of the fact that I might have to use more English as in they wouldn't let me speak Italian perhaps um, and I was also interested in the courses that were available in Bologna because when you're, when you're on your year abroad you can take part in any classes that you want you don't have to do anything that you, you decide which classes to take which is very freeing um, I also had to do German in Italian which was very confusing, and very difficult. <laughs> um, but for example, I could uh, participate in history of art lessons or uh, history of photography lessons. Um, I think I did a mixture. And um, I also wanted to go to Berlin as part of my year abroad because I was studying German. But my teachers at the time advised me against it because they said it's better for you if you stay in one place for the year, for the year abroad. Not only on a human level, as you only have to find one house, you make friends, but you actually understand the university system, 
you understand the country better, the language better. Um, so I did the whole year abroad in Bologna and um, I came back and my Italian was fantastic after years and it was great because it was full immersion. Obviously my German took a hit and I came back with almost an Italian accent which wasn't great whereas all my classmates had gone to Austria and Germany but it just meant I had to work extra hard on German in my final year and um, I actually graduated with a first class which I'm very happy about and um, so that was in 2015. Um, also during my year abroad because it's Erasmus year it's not too say strict with going to lessons and taking part in exams also it's Italy very relaxed here um, I also managed to find an internship at a private art gallery because this is when I was still interested. I knew that I wanted to be part of the cultural sector in some way. And um, so that's how I started building this network, which I'm still part of today. And as Connie mentioned, having a network is so, so important. I know this applies to many other sectors, but I think this is very relevant in the art world. Um, it's very old school in this sense. It's about who you know how you know them and how you keep up this network. Um, after graduating from Sussex, um, I decided to come back to Bologna and do my master's in arts and culture management. So this is in the economics faculty here in Bologna. I also decided to do this because I was, um, I was able to uh, apply for funding as an international student. So funding actually covered all of my master's costs. Um, and this was very attractive instead of perhaps paying a large amount for a course in London. Um, and through that, through my master's, I um, went to the, I actually moved to Venice for a period of time. I worked at Viennale, which I based my thesis on, which I absolutely loved. I did a thesis on exhibition organization and the logistics and the how how exhibitions come together and how they're very different from the initial thought to what we see as a spectator at the end of the day. Um, and I also did an internship at the Peggy Guggenheim collection. So what I have noticed from my degree and from my background wanting to work in the art world is that not having a degree in art history was seen as a disadvantage um, because it was regarded as you you don't know what you're talking about, you don't know things about art history, but actually I learned it by doing. So at the Peggy Guggenheim, I studied, I researched, you have to do uh, guided tours in different languages. And so I learned by doing basically, and I added to my CV from these various experiences. Um, I decided to come back to Bologna, even though I really enjoyed Venice, I really loved living there. Um, and then I started working in different um, exhibition spaces. So I worked in a private foundation for photography for a couple of years, worked as a cultural mediator, so giving guided tours, educational workshops, not only with children, but also with university students, with adults. I really love making exhibition spaces accessible and making them feel like spaces where anyone uh, is welcome to enjoy and understand or not understand as much as they want, but also make it a space where people feel free to ask. I don't understand what I'm looking at. What is this? Why is this important? Why should I care about Picasso? Why should I care about the sugar? Like, but also on a more contemporary level. I worked at university museums, which is very different because it's also a different aspect when it comes to logistics and also cultural heritage and how they're looked after. And in the past year, to kind of move things on, I've um, decided to go uh, full, fully freelance as an art journalist. I almost fell into this job because a friend of mine asked if I would cover for her to go to an exhibition and write about it afterwards. And I said, sure, I'm happy to go. And um, turns out I can write about art after all these years. Uh, it's a skill that I've acquired um, and I also knew that I wanted to move away from working with the public for at least a period of time. It's very, very, um, it's a lot of energy to work with the public and for example educational workshops and guided tours. It's 
so I knew that I wanted to look work more on the academic side of art and so yeah so this is so I work for a couple of magazines art magazines I don't know if you can actually see me but yesterday I received a very um, exciting delivery because I um, I wrote for this magazine Lampoon and it's the third time that I've been printed uh, in print um, I met the fashion designer Sir Paul Smith in Milan uh, in June and we discussed cars it's very strange but that's <laughs> design um, but through the magazines I've been able to do loads of interviews I've um, improved my writing skills and that's why I've decided to go into it full time and become self-employed through this. I also at the same time translate um, because it's very difficult to uh, to um, earn fully as a, a journalist um, especially when you're talking about something so specific. I specialise in contemporary art um, but that's part of my day now is pitching to other magazines, other um, newspapers and asking them I want to propose this idea, I have an interview ready, would you like me to write it? Um, so recent articles for example art market growth so even though we have rising living costs or in Ukraine um, just coming out of pandemic why is the art market still growing people are still investing for example I also wrote an article about feminist art so it's very varying and through this I have to do a lot of research a lot of reading um, keeping up to date on new exhibitions and going to exhibitions and um, going to add I, I also speak on the radio for BBC Radio Cymru so it's a Welsh speaking BBC radio and I work as an arts contributor for them so I comment on exhibitions I um, very briefly explain why the Tate has a Cezanne exhibition at the moment and why it's important um, so yeah so this is more or less my journey to where I am today um, I think it's so so important to try different different things so going from commercial art fairs private art galleries trying university museums um, local exhibitions or cultural events and understanding what role you'd like to find in the art world and um, I know now that this is where I want to be which is writing about art um, but also in a freelance manner so I'm uh, this so freelance would which would mean that I'm doing it um, according to my own terms so I decide when I work I decide if I do nine to five if I work on a Saturday if I don't work on a on a Friday um, but then again you have to be on top of it yourself and uh, how you get paid etc etc um, extra extra um, when it comes to the art world um, this also includes the cinema um, I also work for various film festivals on a project base and so I've done subtitles I've done translation and subtitle making um, but also working for the film festivals here in Bologna or nearby and um, with friends uh, we also organize a film festival here in Bologna which is completely voluntary based but I think sometimes when you want to see something happen you also have to make it yourself um, and then you can find funding and you can find ways of keeping it going I hope this is very clear what I've spoken about and not too <laughs> uh, too long um, and I look forward to any questions you might have um, if it's living abroad or studying abroad or in our world thank you thank you so much Bersney um, but you seem to have just done such a vast amount in <laughs> you know the seven years or so since you left uh, Manchester High um, yeah I don't uh, yeah there just seems to be so so many different strands to, to what you've done and what, what you're doing but it was I think it's very 
very interesting what you said about how obviously you've done you've done a degree in in, in languages so you chose a different route initially but um your kind of love of, of languages and obviously italy has has also been really really important hasn't it as well um do you speak welsh as well so yeah my first language is welsh i, ah, I come from okay. a bilingual family so right. i grew up in north wales and then i but i came to manchester just in time for high school so right that's why, yeah. So I've always been interested in languages, exactly. I think I, I think I did know that you spoke spoke Welsh, but I'd but I'd forgotten that. I think I think I do remember that from from your Latin days. Okay, so um, I can't actually see any questions yet, but maybe people are, are digesting what they've heard. Um, but uh, yeah, don't don't be shy. Do do pop a question in the um, the chat uh, the chat box. So um, I'm going to introduce now our third and final speaker, um, Marie, who left in 2008, I think. Uh, I think that's right. I think I remember you were in my year, you were in my year seven form, 7G, um, who were a class I absolutely loved and I remember with huge affection. Um, so yeah, so uh, the class of 2008 and um, Marie, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you're working at the Ashmolean but doing a PhD at the same time. So Marie, over to you. Thank you Miss Hannon, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, I'm hoping that you have fond memories of 7G, They're we were memorable for the right reasons. <laughs> We were probably a bit of a handful. Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, obviously thank Miss Hannon and Ellie Horgan for uh, Horrigan for um, inviting us all to speak tonight and to have an opportunity to talk about uh, studying the arts or following a career, pursuing a career in the arts and heritage. I think it's a. I, I mean, I'm super biased. We're all very biased here, but it's a really fulfilling and rewarding sector. Um, it brings a huge amount of diversity and opportunities and um, the job satisfaction is really high. Um, the pay is quite low, generally speaking, but the job satisfaction is high. I'll talk a bit about that towards the end. Um, before I kind of talk about my own career path, I just wanted to sort of echo what Connie and Glesney had said um, about how important it is to really pick, really think about the subjects you're studying at school and really if you're if you're not naturally led towards medicine or law or dentistry like a lot of your brilliant peers will be and at Man High we all have those friends who um, come from really high achieving families who are incredibly ambitious and who know from a very young age that that's kind of the vocation that they want to follow which is all fantastic but for those of us who were kind of more creative and led towards um, career paths that aren't kind of as clearly defined, then I think the best thing to do is to really follow your heart, kind of really follow what subjects it is that you really like to turn up to, you know, which classes do you really enjoy turning up to, which classes do you find, you know, which subjects do you find doing the homework the kind of most enjoyable, and that will really help um, kind of that will help your decision making in terms of picking the subjects that you that you want to pursue at GCSE and at A level. Um, and another thing I want to say that kind of echoes what Connie and Glesney said is that a career in the arts and heritage is not linear. It's very, very rarely linear. It's there's no kind of template for how a career, what a career would look like if you're interested in the arts or, or um, heritage or museums or the cultural sector generally. So um, one of the key things is to really remain open to where that might take you and be fully aware that um, you might progress quite quickly in your career and then you might pause and take a step back and do something slightly different. Um, so like Connie said, you know, she was incredibly creative and practiced art for many years at school and then went down the kind of theoretical route and then did a full circle and came back to kind of practicing art again. In my experience, I studied history of art, worked in the commercial sector of a public museum for many years, and now I'm back at school. I'm a PhD student full time. So it's kind of, you know, just remain open to kind of what happens. Um, 
So yeah, my name's Marie and I went to Man High in 2001 until 2008. So I joined in year seven. Um, and I think what's important to know um, about about me and my experience at Man High, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was um, stimulating and challenging and I have uh, incredible friends as a result of my time at Man High. Um, but the, the important takeaway is that I wasn't a brilliant student. I mean, I was pretty mediocre and average in many ways. Um, I mean, I was never top set and I was never bottom set. I was, you know, I got some fairly good GCSEs and some fairly good A-level results, but, um, you know, I was never extraordinary or anything like that. Um, and I um, kind of thought, uh, you know, I could see all my peers really flourishing and really kind of excelling in all their subjects. And there's me kind of grappling with chemistry A level, you know, with like taking hours to do like a piece of homework that lots of people could do in half an hour. And I was just thinking, you know, I was feeling a little bit lost about, you know, where my natural strengths were and what I was going to do beyond my high. I knew I was going to go to university because I'll be honest, my friends were all going to university. It was the kind of expected thing at Manchester High. Um, my mum went to university and ended up being very successful in her career. Um, I mean, importantly, I wasn't really ready or I wasn't quite ready to stop learning. I just didn't have a clue as to what I was going to end up doing. I actually found um, my time during AS level when we were kind of thinking about applying to university degree courses and things quite stressful because I can I didn't have like a uh, I was worried I was never going to get that sort of light bulb moment about you know I found the course and this is what I'm going to be doing um, but there is a positive end to this story so um, so for GCSEs I kind of followed my heart I suppose and I thought well I really enjoy history I'm going to do that I love sciences so I'm going to do separate sciences um, and naturally um, uh, I'm naturally interested in languages as well I'm half French so I did uh, French and Latin um, and you know I, I kind of went through um, went through the exams for those subjects and then for A level I um, interestingly enough did not do history and I did not do art uh, I did class civ French and for my sins I did chemistry like Lesney I kind of really fought my way to uh, that chemistry A level. At the time, I had a very small inkling that I might want to go into kind of art conservation, uh, kind of restoring old paintings, which requires um, some scientific knowledge because you're doing experiments on old objects and things like that. So chemistry was a useful A level for that. Um, but it was my worst grade. Obviously, I really worked hard to, to scrape that C. Um, and but it was a really good experience for me. You know, it taught me um, you know, uh, a hard working ethic and um, being resilient. And also um, the biggest takeaway from me doing uh, a chemistry A level was that I was the only one in the class, um, bar maybe one other person that wasn't going to pursue a medical sciences course. So um, that was a really interesting environment for me to kind of be in to sort of um, see how that degree could be applied in different ways and um, that a level sorry could be applied in different ways um so yeah so during my time at man high i had kind of two really big moments two big revelations that kind of led me to where i am today and i think the first one is picking class civ um, we didn't do it at GCSE, it was only offered at A level, which I think is still the case now. And it was just mind blowing for me. It was really eye opening, no less because the teachers were incredible. Miss Hannon obviously was uh, a huge influence on me, but I um, thoroughly enjoyed the kind of storytelling aspect of Class Civ, you know, the mythology, the ancient texts, the ancient history and what I discovered in my class of uh, A level was that um, a small part of, of, of that A level is um, dedicated dedicated to analysing ancient art, classical art, and that's where I kind of learned that I uh, was um, comfortable analysing images and analysing art and architecture, and that felt like a really natural way for me to express myself, and I was able to 
talk about art in a way that my fellow students found difficult and I kind of thought there might be something in this. I didn't know what, but I was thinking, right, that's piqued my interest. I'm quite interested in this and it seems to be naturally right for me. Um, because of that, I kind of toyed with the idea of studying classics at university. Um, one of my um, big turnoffs for studying classics was translation. I actually really struggled with translation. Miss Hannon's laughing. I just was terrible at translation. Didn't resonate with ancient Greek or ancient Latin. Um, kind of kept asking the question, but they're dead languages. What's the point? Um, so I thought, well, classics will allow me to kind of do the visual analysis that I really enjoy, but there is also this big part of it that is all about translating old texts. And I don't know if I could stick that out for three years. So um, uh, one of my Latin teachers, Miss Wellesby, had um, had the good common sense to speak to me after class one day and uh, pointed out that one of my um, mock exams for the class of um, A level um, scored 100% on the art and architecture uh, paper. And she said, you know, this is obviously a part of the A level that you're really, really strong in. And I think this is something you should try and pursue at university. And I said, well, yeah, but I don't think there's a course where you can just do art and architecture. And she said, yes, there is. It's called history of art. And I was like, what? So that was the first time I'd learned about a degree called history of art. And I, um, what's important to remember is that I wasn't raised in a creative or artistic family. Um, I didn't um, go to museums or galleries as a young child. Um, the only time I went to those kinds of spaces was actually through Man High and through school trips, which I loved. Um, but it just didn't feel, um, at the time I didn't put two and two together, that, that would like, you know, lead to kind of a career in, in that sector. I didn't even know how you could start such a thing, um, what the options might be. So yeah, the second biggest kind of revelation for me at, at Manhai was, was that conversation with Miss Wellesby, who, um, like Connie, introduced me to Mr Vance and said you should have a chat with Mr Vance. He studied art history and you can find out a bit more and see if it's something that you want to pursue. And I had an incredible moment with Mr Vance, who everybody remembers as terrifying at school, obviously, <laughs> the kindest person ever, but he, he could be quite intimidating. Um, I remember having uh, a quiet moment in the corridor, actually, um, just with, with Mr Vance, and we sat on kind of a seating area near a bay, bay window, and we had what, what you could call like a university tutorial. I mean, we had a, an hour chat over a free, had a free period and we basically talked for an hour about art. And we, you know, we asked each other kind of really probing questions and he really challenged me on some of my views. And I kind of thought, and it just totally sparked something in me and it felt really engaging and stimulating. And I was like, I, I want more of this. Like, can I, you know, tell me about what the degree was like and, you know, what kinds of things I can do afterwards. So um, as a result, I decided to study art history um, and I had considered a few different places. The Courtauld Institute of Art was one of the places um, that I had considered. But like Connie, there's a lot of similarities here. Um, I also found it too small um, and a bit insular and it only does the one degree. Uh, I think it also does art conservation, but it just meant that my university experience was going to be very different to everybody else who were part of big campus universities where people were studying lots of different subjects. Um, and I also didn't want to move to London. Um, I uh, just didn't kind of connect with London in that way. It felt quite far away. So um, I opted to go to uh, the University of Birmingham. Um, which ranked, um, I think it was in the top five at the time when I went, um, and it uh, was an incredible course that had the building where the department was based also had its own art gallery um, and a big kind of appealing factor about that course at Birmingham was that the um, tutorials were really and the seminars were really hands on. Often we would just be taken straight out of the classroom and uh, walk up to the gallery upstairs and we would basically look at the objects um, in small groups with our tutors and lecturers and we would get 
um, you know, hands on gallery experience, you know, in the space, in the context in which these things, these artworks were displayed. So that was really, really um, enriching. And I, um, I should say before that moment um, of me going to study art history at Birmingham, um, Miss Walsby gave me some homework. Um, she very kindly, I'll never forget this, she bought me um, a small collection of art books, really, really well known um, art scholarship, which many art history students still use today in their first year at university. And she also lent me her personal kind of DVD collection of a program called Civilizations, um, which is quite dated now. They kind of remade it a few years ago, but at the time was kind of a big kind of documentary about why art is important to society and why we should look after it and why artists are still, um, you know, kind of radicals in our society and important to kind of help us push our knowledge forward. Um, and so she, bought these books and lent me her DVD collection and said, you're spending the summer reading this and watching this and come back to me in September and let me know what you think. And and I couldn't get enough of it over the summer, essentially. I came back in September and I said, that's this is what I want to study. And that kind of took me on a on a journey to apply to different places um, to do the degree in art history. And I opted for Birmingham. Um, and that was when I um, I talked about being fairly mediocre and average at Man High, <laughs> and I and I honestly believe, looking back, that like we're all unique, we're all very different, and we all develop at our own pace, and we all kind of flourish and blossom in the time that we, the time that's right for us, and that can be at different stages in our career. So, and it's also really dependent on like you know where you are and who you surround yourself with and what you're studying and those kinds of things and for me I really found my element at Birmingham I uh, the course was the right fit I had the right people around me my supervisor who took me under his wing was incredibly inspiring and without all of those things I mean I, I wouldn't have come out with you know the the um, result that I did so I ended up with a first which I'm incredibly proud of um, it's you know still quite a rare thing. Uh, I think people underestimate how hard it is to kind of get that result. Um, and then as a result of um, doing so well in my undergraduate um, course, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to do a master's, also at Birmingham in History of Art. Um, and so that decided things for me. I thought, well, great, I get to uh, continue my love of the subject for uh, for another year. I get to work on my own personal research project um, and it's paid for, which means, you know, I don't have to take out more loans or anything like that. So that's really a no brainer. So I carried on um, and I I did my master's um, and I um, submitted and published my thesis. Um, differently to Connie and Glesney, I actually um, focused on old art history. So my specialism is 18th century French art. Um, so I don't look at contemporary or modern stuff. Um, uh, I kind of look at the fancy old paintings that hang in a lot of stuffy galleries. Um, but after the end of that kind of master's degree, I um, had decided, OK, I think I've kind of taken this as far as I want to take it for now. Um, I want to work and get some professional experience in the kind of sector in the in the museum world or the art world. Um, so um, one thing I would say is that if you're interested in studying an arts or humanities degree at university level, contact hours are low, as we've heard. Um, so around that, I would really, really highly encourage and recommend um, everyone to take on additional activities. So like volunteering or internships or just like a part time job that is related to the arts and the humanities. Um, it's not enough nowadays to sort of say, well, I studied the degree. Um, you need to demonstrate your passion for the subject. And the only way you demonstrate that is by saying, well, I also, you know, volunteered at my local museum and I, you know, took groups of people around guided tours or there was a festival in my local town and I was the person, you know, um, registering people to come and visit this artist or I ha helped somebody set up their exhibition or that kind of thing. So 
Um, sadly, a lot of these things are not paid, so you are doing it out of the kind of, you know, goodwill. Um, but they really pay off in the long term because your CV will look kind of quite impressive and um, it will really demonstrate that you're passionate about the subject. Um, so fast forward, after I finished at Birmingham, I um, did a, two internships that were both paid. I was really lucky, they were really competitive. And one of them was a marketing and communications internship at the University Museum um, where I had studied uh, for my undergraduate and postgraduate course. Um, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, so I was marketing um, and publicising the exhibitions that were coming up. I was encouraging people to donate to the museum because it was free to the public, open 365 days a year. Um, and then the second internship that I did, which was part of the University of Birmingham's kind of arts and humanities scheme, um, was with the BBC in Birmingham. And that was um, six months again paid, which was great. Um, and it was all in events management. And it was um, organising public events and festivals linked to the BBC, doing a lot of outreach, um, working with schools, bringing schools in to kind of learn about broadcasting and learn about um, careers in, in the media, um, helping. Uh, there were kind of contemporary artists who were involved with the um, with the local radio stations uh, and news channels, and it was kind of uh, coming up with projects um, so that they could work more closely together and. So that was um, amazing. I had a brilliant time there and it uh, enabled me to um, really pursue a career in events management. Um, I found that so careers in the arts can be incredibly broad um, and there are many, many things that you can end up doing. And I think most people assume that if you studied art history and you like museums, you probably end up being a curator. Um, but that couldn't be further from the truth. There are so many other careers outside of that that are available for pe to people, but um, I just think that it's not as well known unless you're kind of already in that environment. So events management was one of the things that I was particularly interested in. Um, I wanted something dynamic. I loved projects. I loved things that had a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, I liked the um, sheer number of people that I had to kind of onboard and work with. Um, you don't do an event on your own, you do an event with a multi multitude of teams. Um, so that's when I um, stepped, well, I stepped into museums at that point and I took on an assistant manager job um, in a very small independent museum just outside Birmingham um, that was entirely uh, free to the public and it ran on um, donations and ticketed events and some of the rooms were hired out to commercial clients so that it could generate income for the museum to stay open so we could look at collections and various things and that's when I um, really developed my commercial awareness um, and developed my kind of strategic thinking because I ended up managing teams of volunteers but I also programmed um, events. Um, I looked after legal contracts for our corporate and commercial clients. I also uh, completed like uh, fundraising applications so that we could generate some income um, to acquire new works of art um, or take on new projects. So small museums are um, really exciting places to work in, um, but often they're very under-resourced and they're really strapped for cash. So it means that um, you get a huge amount of experience working in lots of different things to do with museums. Um, like I said, from you know looking after the building, researching the artworks, managing the volunteers, um, fundraising, all those kinds of aspects. Um, but it can mean that you end up being a bit of jack, a jack of all trades and you don't really get a specialism in anything. Um, so I did that for a year, year and a half, and I realised during that time that um, I was mostly led towards um, a commercial career in museums. So um, one thing that I was really passionate about, and I'm still very passionate about this today, is that we're really fortunate in the UK that our galleries and museums are free of charge to the public but somebody's got to pay the bill to keep the heating on and to keep the lights on and to pay the staff and to preserve the artworks and to put on the free tours. And you can't do that without having a really strong commercial um, 
commercial plan behind every kind of public institution. So um, I was lucky enough to get a job at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Um, it's Britain's first public museum and it's got over a million objects um, on display and it's open 365 days a year and it welcomes just under a million visitors a year. And it's an incredibly exciting place to be in because it's in Oxford, which is kind of the centre of, um, well, Oxford will say it's the centre of the world, but it's, um, you know, the centre of a lot of um, incredible academic research. Um, and it has, um, you know, it's part of this group of other museums and galleries and gardens and libraries that um, really support kind of world leading research. Um, and I, uh, yeah, so I was really lucky to kind of secure a job in the in the commercial team of that museum um, and I stayed there for four years, um, thoroughly enjoyed it. I ran all the corporate and commercial events for the museum, so big private banks, um, big businesses, um, gala dinners, that kind of thing, who, who wanted to uh, you know, all these kinds of clients that wanted to host an event in a really um, inspiring venue um, and and use the museum as a kind of backdrop to kind of host their um, host their events and engage their employees and engage their um, sponsors, that kind of thing. So um, I managed that portfolio um, and generated a huge amount of income for the museum, which all goes back into the good work that we do for the public. Um, so it felt like a really positive thing that I was doing. I was also looking after um, all the film crews. So we have um, obviously our objects are important for documentaries and programmes and independent researchers and that kind of thing. So lots of um, TV channels and TV programmes and radio broadcasters and stuff would contact us on a regular basis saying we're interested in this samurai outfit. Can you find an expert in the museum that can talk to us about it that we can interview? So I did a lot of coordinating the, the contracts uh, and the relationships and then organising the so the relationships between the curators, the academics and the um, film crews. And then I also coordinated the, the the filming arrangements that took place on site. And it's often they had to take place before the museum opened or after the museum shut. So they were kind of often unsociable hours. Um, but it was really exciting to kind of um, be a part of that. Um, one um, big kind of moment for me was um, the Discovery of Witches programme that um, ran on Sky uh, a few years ago, which is all about vampires and witches. Um, they filmed at the Ashmolean overnight for two nights. Um, so we had to close down the entire museum and they basically took over a whole forecourt and we had two kind of 18 wheeler lorries parked with the in front of the museum and we had to close down the street and we had I think I had about 20 people working under me for that particular project to make sure that the uh, objects were kind of beautifully wrapped and looked after and preserved so that you know nothing was going to get damaged um but you know that generated a huge amount of income for the museum so um you know and 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 the reputation as well which meant that um the museum was you know, on TV and that people, you know, could find us and visit us afterwards and that kind of thing. So that was um, that was great. So I I had four very enjoyable years there. Um, but during my time uh, at the Ashmolean, I decided that my learning journey hadn't quite finished and that my um, having done a master's, the kind of next intellectual challenge for me would would be to do a PhD. And um, and I wanted to do it in in art history um, or in an art history subject anyway. And I thought, well, I'll only do it if I get funding, because obviously I haven't, you know, it's expensive to take on lots of additional degrees and things. Um, and I was really fortunate that two years ago I was accepted onto a PhD programme um, at Queen Mary um, in London, University of London. And um, and officially my PhD is in history. And here's the funny thing, I never did A-level in history. So, um, you know, it just, it's funny how kind of life takes you in these different kind of paths. Um, and so I embarked on that two years ago, um, part-time, and I have only recently kind of um, switched to full-time so that I'm completely dedicated to the PhD now, um, every day. A bit like being your own boss, it's kind of strange having unstructured 
time and kind of thinking about you don't have a you don't have anyone sort of sort of telling you what you should be doing so you have to be really disciplined and you have to sort of plan your week and you know motivate yourself to kind of get to the get to your office or get to the computer at a certain time and kind of put in the work um and i yeah so i'm doing i'm doing that full time and then i still work one day a week at the ashmodian um just to um pull me away from the laptop from once in a while and just kind of keep stay connected to the to the museum world um so yeah so that's kind of my journey um into arts and heritage i hope that was kind of clear and not too waffly um i think one of the um yeah, one of the main takeaways, I mean, one of the main messages I would I would share, and I think I said this at the beginning, is that like a career in the arts and heritage is very rarely linear. So it never follows kind of a clear path or a clear structure, like here's the progression, you'll do this, and then after a year you'll do this. Like it, you have to take control of your own career development. And it's really great for people who are fiercely independent and who are, um, you know, who kind of really listen to their own kind of desires and who kind of pursue things and who are proactive so i think that's one of the big pluses um for a career in the arts and, and heritage um i would say that generally it's not super well paid in comparison to kind of work in the corporate sector um or you know indeed medicine and, and law so you have to kind of think about that you work often in the arts and heritage sector because you're passionate and because the job satisfaction is high and you really believe in the value that art can bring to people's lives. Um, one thing that somebody told me a while ago is that whilst the medical sciences uh, make our lives longer, it's the arts and humanities that make our lives worth living. So I think it's important to remember that, um, that, you know, I think museums make our lives richer in so many ways. Um, and that's kind of what why we do what we do. Um, the other thing is big message, and I think I said this earlier, is that having a degree in the subject is definitely not enough. Get experience outside of the degree, volunteer, film some TikTok videos of you explaining an artwork, write something for your departmental blog or school magazine. You know, you really need to demonstrate that you are absolutely passionate about that area of art or the subject um, because that's what will really stand you in good stead for when you when you're ready to take on you know a, a job or a paid internship in the arts and, and heritage sector um how am i doing for time don't know if i okay wrap it up yeah um I mean, I might be able to answer some of these questions if there are some um, about um, what what kind of diverse careers are available in arts and, and heritage. But what I would say is that they're incredibly broad. Do your research, speak to as many people as you can who are working in various fields, whether it's private art galleries and contemporary art with contemporary artists or it's university museums or it's uh, pop up exhibition spaces, they're all they all require quite different things and quite different skills and figure out what kind of person you are. So do you. Do you like working on your own or do you like working in big teams? Do you like working behind the scenes? So if you do, archiving and cataloguing with objects might be something really interesting for you. Or do you like working with the public? And if so, you might like to be working with schools or engaging um groups with guided tours that kind of thing um yeah figure out kind of what type of person you are and how how you like to work best because that will help you decide the kinds of areas within within the arts heritage and museum sector you'll gravitate to i think and that's probably everything i should say at this point <laughs> i'll hand back to miss hannon <laughs> Thank you, Marie. That very, very, very honest um, and very insightful about the whole, you know, the career landscape and, you know, the ups and downs and the opportunities and how to kind of go about building a, a career. Um, I think that was just so useful, really, for everyone to hear about just what it's like to have to kind of stand on your own feet and make your way into 
you know start off your career in, uh, um, in that in that area um, I can't actually see any questions yet um, I don't know whether that's just my my version of teams but I can't actually see any so I'll, I'll press on with uh, with my bit fairly quickly and if anyone does want to ask a question you need to put it in the in the chat in about the next um, three or four minutes I think um, can I have my next slide Ellie so uh, normally I, I do I do pick a, a, a degree and I, I did go for history of art because I knew that um, Connie and, and Marie both studied history of art I didn't actually know that Connie went to uh, studied at UCL so that was that was purely accidental um, but I did pick this degree because um, I was kind of drawn by the fact that uh, UCL has its own art museum I didn't realize that Birmingham does as well but I know that now um, but I liked I just thought that if, if someone was interested in in uh, in history of art then London was the obvious place to pick um, with all the you know the galleries and the libraries and the collections and the architecture and so on so um, just a couple of little kind of the nitty-gritty about this degree um, the entry requirements at the moment are AAB. You don't have to have any specific subjects. Uh, I don't know whether that was different when, when you applied, Connie, I'm not sure. Um, they do stipulate that having an essay based subject is, is an advantage. And we've heard quite a lot about, I suppose, the value of, of you know, writing about art and writing about culture and writing about literature and the kind of skills that that can, uh, that can help you develop. Um, as Connie said, there's the option to study a language in first year and also a subsidiary subject. And just looking at their website, there seems to be like a huge range of those, um, those on offer. There's, UCL also has a, a list of preferred A-levels, but um, it's very, very broad. Um, so that's not really an issue. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So. I saw that two of you had uh, studied a master's, so I, I picked out a, a, a master's degree as well. Um, this one's at Leeds, so I thought having picked a London course, I should kind of reflect and come back up to the north. Um, and this is Arts Management and Heritage Studies. So I, I wanted to pick a, a, you know, a master's degree that was in, in this area. And, uh, and this one is a, is a one year master's full time or two years part time. Um, you need a 2-1 to be accepted onto it and you need to show evidence of critical thinking, which I think is something that all three of you have, have mentioned at, uh, at some points. So I thought that was interesting. It also links to what Marie was just saying, because they also require um, evidence that you've done some volunteering or some work experience in a connected field. And I thought, Marie, that was a really, I mean, quite a few of you have, have talked about how the contact hours were quite low for um, for your degree, maybe not so much yours, Glesney, uh, with, with two languages, but for history of art, there was only what, 10 hours of teaching a week, which does, I know you've got your own independent work, but you have got time um, to, you know, pick up some volunteering or some, some work experience or, or, or something else. Um, it's not London, but Leeds Sorry, does have also... lots of arts and culture um gone gone go can i add just for arts management uh, which yeah. i did um at uh, masters at bologna the course itself was actually in english okay. so it was very open to international students for me it was just an advantage the fact that i could also speak italian and i could keep up my italian outside of uni life um a real change was the fact that it was part of the economics faculty so half of the course I did not enjoy. So statistics, project management, it was useful accounting, um, very, very useful because it's the, re it's the realities if you see mm -hmm. art also as a business. So running a museum or running a project or running a cultural event, you need to know the realities of it as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, but as you said, um low hours with con with the teacher so i really filled up extra time by working in a gallery and doing extra projects um because i you have to build up your cv exactly 
yeah but it was thanks to this course that I actually moved to Venice so it's using the contacts and using um, the course to see further afield not just seeing it as an economics course or yeah. perhaps there's something you don't enjoy but the fact that you could also study abroad even in English if, if languages isn't necessarily yeah. I was um I was tempted to I don't know that I might I was tempted to go for a, a master's in in Europe having looked at what what you've done Glesney but I wasn't sure about um the situation post Brexit with student visas and, and work visas and so on which is why I kind of played it safe and went went for one in the UK but I, you know, are, are many of those master's courses which are taught in English in, in European cities? I, I, I mean, I guess it's worth looking into if someone was interested in in that as, a, as an option, definitely. OK, um, can I have the next slide, Ellie? I think, do you want to just um, <laughs> fill up the screen? <laughs> OK. So we've talked a little bit about breadth here, but also I think most importantly, um, taking the subjects that that you feel passionate about and you know not giving in to any obstacles that are placed in your path, whether that's, I don't know, through your own kind of perception of your abilities or through through teachers being, you know, standing in your way or or, or whatever. Um, arts, humanities, languages, I mean the uh, and some of you picked up chemistry as well so you know the subjects we offer at Manor High we don't offer history of art A level but we do offer Latin and classical civilization which we'll come back to in a moment uh, plus history and RS and English literature and these are all subjects which will give you such a lot I think in terms of um, cult I suppose cultural literacy or artistic artistic literacy in terms of work experience there's I've found very few formal kind of work experience schemes the way you get for maybe you know law or healthcare um, but you all mentioned I think internships which is something to look into maybe a little bit you know post post a level um, I like the idea of these speculative approaches you know get in touch with your local gallery your local museum um, you know fire off the emails See if there's anything that you can do that you can build to help to build your CV. Um, quite a few people talked about commercial experience. I don't know, Marie, did you want to chip in there? Yeah, I was just going to add that actually during my master's, I ended up volunteering at Quarry Bank Mill and Style Estate, um, which is a National Trust property. So, and you know, National Trust is a really well known uh, brand, uh, heritage brand. So it's just a really, and they're desperate for volunteers. Um, but again, these places are strapped for cash, so it's not like they'll advertise graduate schemes or anything like that. That's reserved more for kind of the corporate sector, legal professions. Um, for our um, line of work, we do have to be quite um, proactive and bold and just make yourself useful and uh, known. I think that's the best way to kind of put it. Um, yeah, commercial awareness is so important, even for the private art world, right through to university museums. Um, you um, have to have some kind of understanding that, um, you know, to run these things um, efficiently and sustainably, um, you know, some kind of commercial awareness is required. Um, so uh, that can be anything from fundraising to obviously uh, like ticketed cultural events and programmes uh, or like even working in retail and merchandising. So a lot of museums and galleries have uh, very successful shops out of you know exit via the gift shops obviously a, a well-known phrase but you know that generates income um, and it promotes the museum or gallery brand uh, artists are able to sell their work in those spaces so uh, having some kind of awareness is really important too Thank you. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, these are some of the things that if you're if you're at school now, you know, and you've done kind of um, charity, you know, charity projects and so on and fundraising, those are skills that will be useful in, in your future career. Definitely. Um, obviously, 
our three speakers have all been um, graduates, um, some with further degrees as well. Um, there are some apprenticeship routes, but these tend to be below degree level and they're aimed at very specific roles in the, the world of heritage and arts. So Marie mentioned, um, you know, being a curator. Um, my sense, and you three obviously know far more than I do, is that um, an undergraduate degree will keep your options open and, and maybe open up more pathways into, into the future um, at the moment anyway. I mean, apprenticeship routes do tend to be quite, um, they can be quite narrow. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's where we are at the moment. That's the landscape at the moment. Ali, can I just have the next uh, slide, which I think is the last one? Um, I'm going to break with tradition here, and I don't think I've ever done this before, but I am going to I am going to put a word in for my own subject area. Um, I'm emboldened by what Marie has has said. Um, obviously, you know, obviously, I think the classics is a great. Um, I'm a great advocate of the classics. Um, I think there's few subjects which kind of develop your cultural literacy in the way that uh, classical civilization or Latin or Greek do. And certainly if you're talking about the art and culture of the West, there's so much in that that has its roots in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. I think it's a, it's a great starting point for someone who's passionate about the arts and, and, and literature. Um, and that's the end of my little promotional um, spot. Oh, um, back closer to home. These were just some of the opportunities that I found uh, around Manchester and, and the North West and the Sheffield. Um, these are all organisations which kind of promote the arts and heritage to, to young people. Um, I've got information about all of them if anyone's um, interested. Um, the Hackspace one is maybe a little bit more technology oriented, but the others are very very geared towards people who are interested in arts and culture and maybe a career in that area. And my last slide, Ellie, if you just hop on, um, I just found this organisation which I thought was interesting called Young People in the Arts, um, who are looking for uh, looking for, for mentors. Um, but presumably if you're at the, at the start of your career, this is an organisation which might be able to help you um, as well. And that's the end of my uh, section. I still can't see any any questions. Ellie, are there any questions? Is there a question? OK. Uh, OK, so I have a question. How do you find inspiration for your art uh, and your writing and motivate yourself if you're self-employed? So, Connie, could you maybe tackle the, the first part? And then I'll open up the second part about motivation to all three of you because it kind of applies to all of you, doesn't it? So, Connie, do you want to say something about finding inspiration for your own for your own art? Well, I feel like obviously you can't see what type of paintings I do, but my paintings are very like expressive. They're kind of it sounds a bit cliche, but mine's just kind of like it's just pure expression. But for me, I think my inspiration is just an accumulation of like all my experiences throughout life. Um, but for my work now, what I'm learning is it's really, I mean, I think the message of my art, I want it to be, is it's, it's kind of very positive because I used to paint quite in like a dark way, but now it's a very positive message. I want my art to be uplifting. So I think I'm just inspired by like ob observing people every day and things like that. Yeah. But it's very like kind of just more of a intangible in the thing that I'm yeah, inspired by. OK, and and while you're still live, yeah. do you want to say something about the motivation part? Yeah. Have you, have you found yeah. it hard to kind of shift into quite a different way of, you know, a different yeah. daily routine? Well, yeah, for me, for the motivation part, it's just that I need because obviously I, don't, I had a part time job, but then I quit it because I was like without that income. Now it's like I have to do well. So like I have to like work every single day and reach out to people day. And it is. I know it's bad because obviously I'm really passionate about the art, but you also have to be just as passionate about the money and the marketing side, I think, if you mm -hmm. want to make it work and like not, sh you know, struggle, like be like the starving artist. Can you say, like, <laughs> if it, like, it's true, though, like I want it to financially work out as well. So for me, it's kind of money, success motivated as well. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Leslie, how, do you do you find it easy to motivate yourself? You know, now that you're you know you're independent, you're free of a boss, and <laughs> very different. Um, also, like how Marie was saying, you don't have a boss necessarily. Um, for example, one of the magazines I write for, um, they're based in Hong Kong. So these are people maybe I'll never meet. I, we've not Zoomed or anything. We have a purely email relationship, um, which is very surreal. Um, no, but I, um, I've just found it very freeing the past year to really be doing something I love. I love researching. I love going down tangents into artists and going down and finding out about an exhibition and then also going to exhibitions being invited to exhibitions um, i'm invited to an exhibition this evening i just got invited to an exhibition of sonia boyce um, she's a british artist who won the golden lion at the venice biennale this year she represented the uk and um so it's exciting things like that so that i'm not but of course I have, to, it's so much time management. So I work with deadlines. And so I know I write better in the mornings. And so what I normally do, for example, is I concentrate on writing until lunch. Um, and then maybe more in the afternoon, I do more research based or even administration. So writing invoices, um, uh, running after people, catching up, seeing, uh, and also sending pictures, uh, sending emails, uh, maintaining that network which is uh, really important. I also wanted to add before I forgot to what Connie said at the beginning, Instagram has become so important, um, which is um, a bit surreal in itself because it's just a social media, but that's exactly how I contact artists, critics, uh, galleries, um, if I can't find an email address, for example, uh, but also how I find out about events, exhibitions, new artists, so it's a very, very useful tool. And so I'm, it's no surprise that Connie is able to sell via Instagram because it's become such a valid platform uh, for the arts and promoting visual imagery. So yeah, this is my motivation. I think it's also the fact that it's fresh from the past year, the fact that I've gone fully freelance um, and that, that I'm also doing translation work at the side. So it's not, um, too much and then I'm able to do both it's, it's very stimulating work yeah okay Marie do you want to chip in with anything on those two points yeah, I, I'll just be very quick, um, I, sort of picking up a bit on what um, Glesney said, just that um, variety in my day is really important. And I think that's motivating. I mean, being motivated every day is, the, I think, is a holy grail. It's really difficult to find that sweet spot. And I think as a creative thinker and um, who's kind of constantly in need of, of like ideas and energy to kind of express what it is that they're kind of thinking and writing about or producing. Um, you, you need to find something that works for you that is that is you know unique um i it depends kind of you know are you an early riser or are you uh, late to bed or uh, do you do you think more clearly first thing in the morning or do you kind of need to have lunch and then kind of think you know settle into things in the afternoon so you kind of figure figure it out as you go along because certainly for me that's been the case with my phd spent a whole year trialing various things scrap the things that didn't work now i have a fairly good i can't do a daily planner with every hour kind of lined out for for the day but i will have a loose structure for the week and i am an early riser and i think and read more clearly and write more clearly first thing in the morning and then usually by two o'clock i'm i'm done my brain just doesn't want to do any more so at that point i will meet somebody for coffee, I'll go for a long walk, I'll browse in the charity shops, I'll do other things to kind of take my mind off, uh, you know, give my brain a bit of, bit of a rest. Um, and so you kind of pick your, pick your, um, pick your routine and your like tempo. Um, I'm a bit of a digital dinosaur, I don't have Instagram, I would say Twitter for me works because I uh, because I'm doing a PhD, I am kind of have to be connected with academics and connected with universities and re latest research and publications. So Twitter is kind of the natural platform for that. Um, so yeah, I might tweet some things in the afternoon and that kind of helps me to communicate what it is that I'm thinking about and also get some feedback on 
whether those ideas are any good or relevant. Yeah. OK. OK, um, we don't seem to have any more questions, so I think we're going to uh, tie things up. So um, I just want to say thank you to our three speakers who've just given us such an amazing insight into into what they do and uh, and, their, and their kind of journey so far. And um, thank those of you that have, have attended the talk. And just to say that our next insight talk is an insight into education, and that is on Thursday, the 1st of December. So um, hopefully we will um, see some of you at that. Um, and good night, everyone. <laughs>